Hey, Pastor, do you are you ready? Or hey, way to go, you two! What a couple! Aren't they amazing? They do everything. <laughs> uh, you can get the snow off our windshields before we uh, leave today. Okay. All right. Good morning. Yeah. yeah. We like our cars warmed. We don't ask much. We're not demanding. Good morning. Good morning to everyone online, too. Glad to see you all. So the hardy are here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, crazy or hardy. All right. Well, it is Valentine's Day. Isn't it fun to be here together and uh, thinking about his love a little deeper? Um, I've been reading this book by Bob Goff, and it's called Everybody Always. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's pretty amazing. I recommend it. And his whole deal is don't talk about it, be about it, about the love of God. And uh, there's this one thing that he talked about that really has made me think a lot about love. He said, if you want a report card on your love of God and your love of people, um, make a list of the people that annoy you or the people that you, that are difficult. He calls them crazy people in your life. <laughs> uh, people that are difficult. And um, ask yourself, how much love have I extended towards them? Either for resolve or if there has to be a boundary just to pray for them, you know? Um, he said, that's the report card on love because love isn't complicated, but it's not easy. And I like that. So, morning, Mueller's. Nice to see you. Yep. So uh, that's really been a challenge for me because it's interesting. Um, Jesus didn't say love the easy people in your life. We wouldn't need a savior then, right? You know, and uh, he loves us all the same. So I really like it when we come together that we position ourselves before we sing and worship because we can just sit here and space off for a few minutes and it means nothing, right? We have to be intentional about anything we do. And so today, let's just think, if I love God, then I love the people he loves. And I can't decide on just categorizing them, right? Easy people, yeah, this is where I'm gonna spend the majority of my time. And those that are difficult, I just don't think about, you know, they're on a shelf, but that's not God. And um, so let's just make that our challenge and our focus today, just he loves us a good, good father, and every day he looks at us and goes, you are incredible, you know, and we need to offer that same towards other people, too. All right, so, Jesus, thanks for your love today. Thank you that it's Valentine's Day and that you care about us, and you, you love us no matter what is uh, in our lives. Thank you that you think we're incredible, and help us to be able to look in the mirror and go, I'm incredible because of you, Lord. And uh, not a thing of pride, but a reality of who we are, that we're your children. Help us to respond to others that same way. Help us to love you and love the people you died for. Amen. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to see.
thought we had to have a song with snow in it today. Just had to. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow.
picked this song this morning, I thought about something that, um, about love that's really cool, is that love chooses the highest good for the other person. And that, I love that definition of love. And um, again, it's not difficult, but it's not easy, <laughs> you know, to live by. And um, at school, we've been reading the Chronicles of Narnia, which is pretty cool. I'm really glad we can do that. And we read um, The Boy and His Horse. And if you'll bear with me, this really does apply, and it's a really great angle, I feel. So, you know, Aslan, if none of you are familiar with it, um, C.S. Lewis wrote this six books that are incredible. And the lion is Christ. His name is Aslan. And so um, Shasta was this poor boy. He had a lot of difficulties. And through his life, he didn't know um, Aslan the lion yet till the end of the book. But through his life, this lion would show up. And sometimes it would be chasing him and his horse. And he was just afraid of this lion. And at the end of the book, Aslan comes along, Shasta, this boy, in a dark, dark wood, and Shasta can feel his breath. And he's afraid at first. And then Aslan reveals himself as the one all through his life in difficulties that he was there for him. And Shasta couldn't see it at the time. When the lion was chasing him, he thought it was a bad thing. He said, that was me. I was chasing you out of danger that you couldn't see. Um, in the night when you were freezing in the desert, that warmth you felt, I wrapped myself around you. I was there. When you were going to fall off the cliff at night and you felt a presence, I was beside you going. And um, it just gave me chills as I was reading this, and I wanted to yell out to the kids, that's Jesus, you know. <laughs> but you, I've had chances. But, um, but love chooses the highest good. And when I think of this song, first when we learned it, I said, I don't know if I think this is correct. You're perfect in all your ways. I've had loved ones that have died at, at 38 years old. That doesn't feel like love to me, you know? We don't understand everything. There's hard things that happen. But the big picture is he chooses the best for us. And we have to, you know, trust him with that. I don't know why some things happen, but I know at the end of the book, he's going to explain things. And then it might not even matter, you know? But that just jumped out at me. You're perfect in all your ways. How can that be perfect? Because we trust him. And he chooses the best for us, you know? He chooses the best. And um, it's good. We know the end of the story. And um, it would be good. So that gives us faith for today. And I know all of you... I mean, I know quite a few of you pretty well. You haven't had a perfect, easy road, you know, but you're choosing love, and that makes a difference. So that leads into this. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace. Great is the man. 
treasure of our Father's love. Well, great is the measure of our Father's love. Oh, great is the measure of our Father's
God is good, amen? Yes. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for those of you who are here who made it through the uh, snow. Uh, I don't know what, how you feel about it. I know that there's varied opinions, but uh, I think it's beautiful. It's a blessing for Valentine's Day is that powdered sugar look. So, uh, But if you don't like the snow, a few days it's all going to be gone. So don't worry about that. So it'll all be gone. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate it so much. All right, and welcome those of you who are online or watching this at a later time. We're glad you're with us today, and we're glad that we're able to stream so that you can be with us today. Uh, it just works out better that way than just completely being separated from uh, the rest of our people. So, all right, so today is Valentine's Day, of course, and I see some of you brought your Valentines with you, so I uh, hope that you treat them right. Today and also today uh, for birthdays and anniversaries, I just wanted to make mention uh, today was Joanne Smith's birthday, and of course she's in heaven now, but uh, we just want to honor her, her memory as she passed away this past year. So uh, today was the day, Joanne Smith, so I'm sure she's having a wonderful time up there right now. Saturday on the 20th is Ed and Hazel Doherty's birthday, 23 years. So happy anniversary to the Doherty's. Okay, and uh, some things coming up. Um, next, next Sunday is the 21st, and we've been announcing this. If you are a member of the church, then we encourage you strongly to be here. We'll have our annual business meeting at 5 o'clock right here next Sunday. Uh, and that will happen at, well, at 5, as I said. And if you're not a member, you're certainly welcome to come. But uh, members need to be here, of course, uh, for the business meeting. Also, that morning, we have a guest speaker. We have uh, Pastor Bill Wilson coming from the Oregon Ministry Network. As uh, he comes, and it's kind of traditional for when there's a new pastor, pastoral change, that he comes and kind of gives the blessing of the network. And so he'll be here with us. I'm sure you'll enjoy him. He is just a, a great man of God, and I really look up to him as my leadership that I follow. So uh, please make sure that you're here. It's going to be a great day in the Lord, and there won't be any snow. So anyway, amen. Well, uh, I know that it's BGMC Sunday. I didn't roll Buddy out earlier because I wasn't sure how many people would be here, but it, look, apparently we have some. So if I could get some assistance from some of our younger folks, would you come and roll Buddy out and let's do the whole thing? Kind of a tradition that we do, I know. Thank you so much, Reina. But really, it's more than just a tradition. It's a way to teach young people uh, about missions giving and faithfulness in missions. You probably want to... Turn him around, perhaps? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Does he have a face on? Oh, he does have a face on both sides. Okay. So it doesn't matter. Okay. But there's buckets up there. All right. So this, again, it's a way to teach kids about supporting our missionaries. So mom's giving instructions from the audience. Uh, yes, so that we don't know ahead of time. <laughs> She didn't go through the training class, I guess. Training class. Okay, so if you have something for Buddy, are we not even, don't, don't let it go because then we'll know that it's not really balanced and so it could, there could be some. If you have offerings today, bring them on up. Thank you very much. If you need a bucket buster, go ahead and put a bucket buster in there or three. How many bucket but They're down there. I didn't bring them up here yet. All right. Comes a couple of young men with beards. <laughs> not in the girls. Yeah, just because you have daughters, you're not going to do that, huh? Yeah, I see how it is. All right. 
<laughs> it's only because he wanted to be on camera, right? That's it. Oh, we got some fist full of change. All right, anybody else have BGMC offering? Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. All right, let's see who's got the heavier bucket. Looks like the girls do. Good job, girls. But guys, you did a wonderful job too. Thank you. Yeah, just roll him out of the way. He's going to take up all the limelight here. As if there was such a thing as limelight. Okay. Well, it is Valentine's Day, and I thought maybe we would uh, take a look at God's love today. Uh, is a, a day that we kind of concentrate on love and all of that good stuff. And as you know, our focus verse of the month of Feb February uh, that we've chosen, it's on our calendars, also it's out on the road at the, on the signboard, is John 3.16. Who has never heard of John 3.16? That would be, uh, in America, that would be a difficult thing to find someone who's never heard of John 3.16. Uh, and so I have chosen that because I believe it's God's valentine to the world, John 3.16. And so we're going to be talking about that and some other aspects of God's love and how it affects us and what our responsibility is when it comes to God's love. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your love because we know that without it, without your uh, watching over us without your care over us, Lord, we would be nothing uh, if it wasn't for the fact that you sent your own son because of your love, Lord, we would be lost, but we are so grateful. We are so grateful, Lord, for the love that you have shown to us. Help us, Lord, to display that love to one another. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today. Help me to speak your words and as we study this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, in the beginning, God created mankind in his own image. He created them, male and female, he created them. And when it talks about being made in man's, or in God's image, man being made in God's image, that means we possess some of his characteristics. And one of those characteristics is his love. And not only do we uh, display that or have that as one of uh, our characteristics is of his image, but we are to love others as he has loved us. And so that's what we're talking about today. A uh, well-known poem that comes around this time of year, of course, a uh, beautiful Valentine's poem, Roses Are Red by... No, 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 that's not the one. That's It's this one by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and the breadth and the heart my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and by candlelight. And it goes on and on. How many have heard that? You've heard that somewhere, uh, one place or another. Did Keith tell you that? Did, did he, does he quote that to you every year? Oh, yeah. I'm sure he did, yes. But, you know, that poem is about a deep, everlasting love, and it, and it sounds like God's love, doesn't it? Uh, I love you uh, to, from the, to the depth and the breadth and the height my soul can reach. I mean, it's just amazing, God's love to us. How many remember those, or maybe you, you have some this year, those conversation hearts? That was always a big thing when I was a kid. Is you get those little conversation hearts, the little chalky things with, with uh, words on them. Yeah, mm, delicious, right? Little chalky. And, and sometimes they, if you really imagine hard enough, they actually have flavor. They, you know, like the orange ones taste like orange and stuff like that. But the thing isn't so much about the, uh, the hearts themselves and the, the way that you eat them, but it was the message on there course, uh, the traditional hearts, I love you, and be mine, and, and uh, hug me, and kiss me, and all these, you know, X's and O's, and stuff like that. You, you've probably seen those. Well, nowadays, we have updated ones for our new generation, on fleek. <laughs> Can you believe it? They're out there. 
hashtag selfie, uh, on a heart, uh, let's chill, uh, girl crush, follow me, hashtag smile, insta mine, uh, all of these shout outs. So, yeah, all these messages. But you know, John 3.16 to me is God's conversation heart that says, be mine, be mine. Why? Because he loved the world so much that he sent his own son. He said, I want you to be mine, be mine. That's why I really see it as, as God's valentine to us. Of course, we can probably quote it, uh, but of course it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus gave the invitation. If you uh, remember the story of John 3, Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, came to Jesus by night uh, to make sure that nobody was... He was curious, but he didn't want to be seen. Uh, he was a little shy about that, uh, for good reason, I suppose, in his mind. But uh, during this whole process, Jesus is teaching him about the concept of being born again. Oh, how can that happen? How can I be born again and all of that? And uh, in the midst of chapter 3, of course, is verse 16, where we see the entire gospel in one verse. The entire gospel is there. It's just amazing how God just put it all uh, in there. It's one of the best known verses of the Bible. In fact, perhaps you've seen it watching football or baseball or something like that. I read about a woman who was watching a professional ball game on TV one time with her husband. And the camera panned the audience. It paused for a moment on a man and his son smiling broadly. And they were holding up that card that said, John 3.16. That's all it said was John 3.16. And her husband then saw that and he said in disgust, I don't know why people bring those kind of things into a ball game. You know, I looked that verse up once and it doesn't have anything to do with sports. At that time, the woman didn't know what it meant either because she, she had never looked it up herself. But it caused her to look it up later, and she went on to say this. She said, you know, I guess my husband in some ways was right. John 3.16 wasn't about sports. I couldn't read that verse and learn how to pitch the, the perfect curveball. I couldn't open the Bible and magically perfect a triple axle on the ice. I couldn't recite John 3.16 and suddenly overwhelm others with lightning-fast reflexes in a karate tournament to impress onlookers with my three-point shot in basketball, uh, even not to get nervously dizzy on a high-dive platform. She said, no, John 3.16, he was right. It really wasn't about sports. But John 3.16, uh, while it's not about sports, uh, sports are nothing without it. John 3.16 is the reason that we're given hope. Hope that reaches beyond win winning tomorrow's game. It's hope for winning a blessing in this life and an eternity with the Trinity in the next. John 3.16 is about life and love and pursuit of a goal beyond the clock's buzzer. John 3.16 is about goal of forgiveness and perfect love and faith and hope and everlasting triumph. And that makes John 3.16 on a poster worth holding up in any stadium. Marrying someone who doesn't understand this, dating someone who doesn't care and isn't willing to find out is like showing up for the Olympics. Figure skating doubles with a partner who doesn't believe in ice. You have nothing to stand on. That was her view of it after seeing that. And then later on she said something like, I hope my ex-husband will understand the message someday. How sad. How sad. But the scope of God's invitation, or invitation, not invitation, invitation is unlimited. It says God so loved what? The world. The whole world. Nobody is excluded. Somebody said that there are seven wonders in John 3.16. God, the almighty authority, so loved the world, which was the mightiest motive, that he gave his only son, the greatest gift, that whoever, the widest welcome, believes in him the easiest escape should not perish the divine deliverance, but have eternal life, the priceless possession. 
something that we could never get on our own. But not only does God love the world, but God is love, the Bible tells us. God is love. There are several words in the original Greek that we see in uh, the New Testament that is used for love. There's marital love and brotherly love and all those ones. I'm sure that you've seen those or heard those before. But in English, we mainly have one word for love. And uh, as a result, I love ice cream and I love my dog and I love my wife, but not all the same way. It's one word, but different meanings. Well, in the Greek, they use different words to make it clear what the meaning is of those. And of course, the Greek word for God is love or for God's love is agape. You probably heard that term, agape, which is a uh, a way of saying uh, unconditional, uh, complete love, a love that completely considers that other person's good. The Greek word, one uh, theologian suggested this, the Greek word agape seems to be virtually a Christian invention, a new word for a new thing. Now, there were 20 occurrences of the word agape in the Greek version of the Old Testament, but it's almost non-existent before the New Testament. Agape draws its meaning directly from the revelation of God in Christ. When Jesus came and did what he did, that was the representation of agape for the first time, really, uh, in understanding. It's not a form of natural affection, however intense, but a, spirit, a supernatural fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5. It's a matter of will rather than feeling. For Christians must love those even that those they dislike, Matthew 5. It's a basic element of Christ-likeness. So that's the way he put it, is that agape love was never really fully understood until Jesus came, until the New Testament, until the New Covenant. And that was a, a physical demonstration of God's true love for you and I. And when it says that God so loved the world... He gave Jesus his son. God so loved the world that he gave of himself. When we speak of God's love and that God himself is love, uh, from 1 John 4, 8, says God is love. Uh, again, we're talking about agape, unconditional love, the highest expression of love. But you know, while there are other words meaning love, there's the eros and the phila philadelphia, and all the different ones, I'm probably mispronouncing uh, the case that those are in. I believe that they're all encompassed. Real love happens when agape is overshadowing all of it. Uh, you talk about marital love. You talk about the love between a husband and a wife when they come together in the sight of God and they become one, as the Bible puts it. How could that happen without agape, without that unconditional, selfless love. So agape oversees all of that. It's just, it's beautiful. And it's, a, it's that characteristic of God that we need to have within us. As I said, everyone is included in the invitation, the world, all of humanity. Sometimes we get a little selective, though, but God's not selective at all. Last week we started, uh, or we continued talking about the letters of Paul, and we began the book of Galatians. And if you remember correctly, if you were here, if you watched it uh, last week's service, you'll know that the main problem was the Judaizers, the people who were coming along behind Paul as Paul was teaching God's grace through Jesus Christ. These other guys were coming along behind him and said, "Oh yeah, God's grace in Jesus Christ. Plus, you need to follow the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to do all this stuff." so that you're really saved. Well, that's not God's intention. It wasn't God's intention, and Paul got pretty upset about that. See, these people were being selective. You know, you can be a Christian, but you have to follow these, these ideas because that's what we had to do, and that's what we feel that you need to do in order to be truly saved. But, you know, even in our day and age, we can be a little selective. How many times have we saw someone, their lifestyle or something, and say, you know what, they... You know, they, they'll never get saved. They're, those people are too wicked. They're just, uh, oh man, they're just completely lost. Well, that's not our call. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus died for everyone, no matter their political affiliation, no matter differences of opinion on anything, no matter what their race might be, no matter what their nationality might be. Jesus died for them. And dare I say this, even their gender identity or whatever other thing, their uh, sexual preference, Jesus died for those people. Am I saying that that's okay? No, I'm not. Don't hear that. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that no matter who people are, Jesus died for those people. God loves everyone. God loves everyone. Amen. So let's, uh, that was John 3.16. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. And this is love defined course the great love chapter uh, we'll just look at the beginning of this so what love isn't what agape isn't let me let me just go ahead and read a few verses here if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom the mysteries and all of knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but, not, but do not have love, I gain nothing. What is, what is love not? Love is not necessarily the way to... Uh, an ability to communicate to everyone and anyone. If I could speak in the tongues of, of men or of angels, if I could speak to crowds, if I could speak any language of the world and make my point clear, but don't have love, I'm just a noise. I'm just clanging. If I have all the wisdom and faith, love isn't necessarily grasping all wisdom and, and, and faith. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom mysteries and knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm lacking. Love isn't necessarily, it's often, mo this is motivated by love, but it can happen without it, generosity and self-sacrifice. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship so that I may boast, so that I may boast, but if I don't have love, I gain nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. So that's what love isn't, according to 1 Corinthians 13. But as we read on, <clears throat> excuse me, we see what love is. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, and it's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Let's pause there. So love is humble. It's patient and kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's humble. It's not about me, it's about you. What do you need? What are you lacking? It's about making sure that you, uh, you know, it's, it's all about looking at the other person. Love is also selfless. It does not dishonor others, not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Oh, I just have this grudge. You know, I just can't get over it. Well, you're not loving then because love doesn't hang on to grudges. Even if we're wronged, love forgives Love is also encouraging, verses 6 and 7. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Love, I mean, that's something that I did as a, as a kid. I rejoiced in, in bad things happening to my brother. But that wasn't love. That was just sibling rivalry, okay? Uh, and, and please don't get the idea. That, that I'm over that now. I... I hope he forgives me. <laughs> uh, we both did it, you know. It's just how it is. But that's not love. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Always. 
And love is eternal. Verse 8 says, love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And then verse 13 says, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, agape love. So that's what love isn't and love is. According to 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter. Now let's turn to 1 John 4. John was a great guy. He was the called the disciple that Jesus loved, not that Jesus didn't love the others or that he somehow loved John more. It's just that John was this just this lovey, lovey guy. Now he wasn't always uh, he wasn't like a softy in any way at all. He was also at one point called a son of thunder, where he was ready to call down uh, terrible things on people who didn't believe in Jesus. So he wasn't perfect, but he grew as you read through the Gospel of John and his letters, First, Second, Third John, and the Revelation of John you'll find that that love just grows and grows. His knowledge of love and his expression of love grows. He finally gets it, basically. Agape, I get it now. I get it. And so that's why I often like to go to John's writings because uh, when it's, we're talking about love, it just, he, he got it. He got it, and I want to get it like that. Let's look at... Uh, so here we see for, uh, true love displayed. Let's look at chapter 4. Uh, read through the first few verses here. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and that he is in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know we rely on the love that God has for us. So God loved us even before we loved him. We sing that, we quote that, but really what we're saying is that God loved us, God loved me, even when I hated him. Strong words. But if I'm not following God, if I'm not loving God, looking for his will in my life, it's like I hate him. Uh, Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a right or very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us agape love it's not conditional he didn't say well you have to love me first and then I'll I'll love you you love me first, and then I'll send my son to pay the price that you can't pay. And You know, you got to show me something. Give me a little something. No, he never said that. He never said that at all. So God loved us even when we hated him. And we need to have love for one another. Remember I said that this agape love is a, is a characteristic of God that should be evident in people who follow him. We need to love brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John 3, 16 and 17 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So 
Versi says a really extreme thing. If you love one another, you should be willing to lay down your life for them. And we know that, uh, you know, in the case of, of wartime and you hear about brothers in arms and how they're willing to sacrifice one for another, what a great expression of care and love that is for one another. We need to be willing to give of ourselves for one another because Jesus gave his life for us. But even backing off, because probably nobody in this room is going to be called upon to give your life for somebody else in this room. I don't know that Marty's going to have to sacrifice himself for Rick. I, I just don't see that happening. But even in the simpler things, you see somebody with a need, especially a brother or sister in Christ, and we just say, well, stay warm, you know, stay fed, but yet we don't do anything to help them. Then where's the love being demonstrated? C.S. Lewis, uh, and Debbie was just talking about the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, he wrote several books. And he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And in the book, Mere Christianity, he said this, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, then you will find yourself disliking him less. So it's, it's kind of an attitude thing, too. But not only do we love brothers and sisters, we love people that we like or kind of like, but we also need to love our enemies. Jesus himself taught us that on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? <clears throat> be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So love. Love one another. Even, uh, you know, those who are our enemies, those who mistreat us, we leave it up to God to take care of us and we love as he's told us to do. And of course, as we love our brothers and sisters, we love our enemies, we love God. We need to love God. To love God is really to love one another, I believe. I believe that it really, you can't love God without loving one another. I think we've read that in 1 John 4. You can't really love God unless you love one another. You can't really love God, express this characteristic of God without loving one another. <clears throat> one day Jesus was teaching. He was answering questions about several different topics. This scenario is probably familiar to many of us here. And a Jewish leader came up to him and he said, Hey, what's the greatest commandment? Because we have... You know, we have the, the Ten Commandments, and there's all these laws of Moses, all these commandments and things. Which is the greatest? Because they were watching his answers, and they were thinking, well, this guy kind of knows what he's talking about, and boy, can we trip him up? Uh, what you, hey, go, go and ask him this question. So they sent this guy up there. And said, hey, what is the greatest commandment? Remember what Jesus said? Jesus' answer was basically love. He said, you got to love. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything depends on these two things. He said, the law and the prophets hang on these. It's almost as if they're like two pegs. Loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself, and all the other commandments that you have, all the other instructions that the word gives us, hang on those two things. They're not separated from God's love, but they hang on those two things. We need to love. We must love 
one another. We must show love. And you may say, well, I'm just not that kind of a person. I'm kind of a man's man, and I just, this gushy love. I'm not talking about that. If, if you don't know what agape is by now, then go back and listen to it again, because it's all about respect. It's all about truly caring about others. That's God's love. It's God's love for us and God's love for other, for the world. So John 3.16, if John 3.16 is God's valentine to the world, shouldn't we be faithful to send that valentine on? How many of you, maybe older folks, I don't know, the younger, what's going on, but, but when I was a kid, we used to always have to give valentines. We Everybody made a little pocket out of construction paper, and we made these little pockets, and we... we uh, decorated them up with hearts and they were purple and pink and all the red and all these ones and we had to hang them up in our classroom and then on on uh, when you get closer to valentine's day you had to bring in valentines your mom would usually buy a box of all these little stupid valentines in there you know these all these kind of weird little messages and things and nowadays it's like uh favorite cartoon characters or or the X-Men or something, you know, Valentine, hey, you know, be my Valentine or I'll X you out. Or I don't know. But we used to have to do that. And you'd have to give everybody a Valentine because nobody, you didn't want anybody to feel left out. And it was a little bit weird because you didn't want somebody thinking that you kind of liked them when you did You just had to give them a Valentine. So you might sign something on there, you might not. In fact, I got one one time from a girl I kind of liked. And she said something, I forget what she wrote on there, but it just got me thinking for quite a while because I thought, hey, she liked me. It was just a valentine. She didn't mean anything by it. But you know what? Back to, the, back to God's valentine. God doesn't want anybody to feel left out. And if we are being selective, if we're not being loving like God intends us to be, that we're leaving somebody out. Let's give everybody the valentine because not only is it just making sure everybody gets one, but making sure that everybody knows that God really means what he said. He really, really does love them. And he really wants them to live with him forever, for all of eternity. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son for everyone, that whoever, doesn't matter who you are, whoever believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, what a privilege it is to think about this characteristic of you, Lord, that you made us in your image and that we have uh, the ability to love one another with your great love. Some of us, perhaps, maybe we don't feel real loving sometimes. Sometimes we look at the, the state of the world and it's just depressing and it, it just makes us want to hide. But Lord, I pray that you would, by your strength, help us to love one another as you have loved us. Because you first loved us, Lord. Thank you. God, I pray for each and every one who is here that you would give us a safe trip home and, and a wonderful day. And for those, Lord, watching, I pray that you would bless them, bless their homes, bless their families, and bless each other with love. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A little shorter, but hey, go on and enjoy your family. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.